scripted. But uh, thank you all for being here today. I, I do want to thank you and uh, want to say welcome to this webinar, Introduction to Implant Placement. Um, I hope you're all having a great day out there. The weather is beautiful in Southern California. I know it's warming up all over the country. And uh, good afternoon, evening to you guys in whatever city, state, or country you may be. We have had lots of people from different parts of the world joining these webinars. So. Um, as we start today, I just want to discuss a couple of things. I know I'm not going to make you into an implantologist with a one hour webinar. I, I completely understand that. And if you understood how much I had to do to actually try to place this within one hour of all the material I have. Um, I, I teach a, a three day hands on live web live course uh, where we teach uh, implant dentistry for two days. And then on the third day, we actually place live implants up uh, place implants on live patients. So trying to compact some of this into a one hour will be uh, an interesting time, but we're going to move quickly and we're going to get through it. So I'm hoping we get a lot of pearls for you guys, whether you place implants now or are thinking about it. I'm going to try to make this interesting for both sides and try to get you some things to um, think about during this downtime that we have. Um, Tim mentioned a number of things about me. There's a few more there. Um, I am a member of Catapult Group, and I'll talk about that in a little bit more in a second. I'm also a uh, CRCRA, uh, Gordon Christensen's group evaluator as well. I'm an adjunct faculty uh, with UC San Diego. I am an editor for Inside Dentistry Magazine. Um, I've been a CAD CAM owner since 2004. I've been placing implants since 2006. Um, a little bit about catapult the education typically there's about 25 of us who on an average weekend like this we would be traveling out to a number of the cities in this country or even internationally at times uh, to do live lectures uh, we also do a lot of um, webinars we also do a lot of evaluations of products as well as equipment and like tim was saying we write about these things and I only speak about products and materials that I actually use in my office. So anything I talk about will be used in my office. Um, you've had a number of these catapult speakers already speak to you. They've done some phenomenal job on some different topics to hopefully keep you educated, keep your mind flowing in these down times. Um, a little bit on my info. That is my email. You can email me about anything you want. Actually, earlier today, I had somebody email me about a webinar I did two years ago. So um, it's, it's interesting that people keep that. And actually, I still have the same email. So anytime you have a question, ask away. If it's something I don't get a chance to cover today because we have such a large topic. By all means, feel free to email me. Um, you can also type your questions up in the chat area there. Tim will be going uh, into those and asking me questions at the end of the webinar. I'm also on social media. So if you are on Instagram, uh, please follow me. I do put in some dental information and some humorous things. I don't do much politics. I stay away from that. I think we have way too much of that as it is. Um, and that is the Catapult Education website, which I really advise you to uh, visit because there is some great uh, CEs on there. You can get some CE credits. There's some wonderful webinars in there on some cutting edge uh, materials and techniques as well. Uh, so do check that out. So I've been starting a lot of my webinars with this quote, and it states that my brothers and sisters consider yourselves fortunate when all kind of trials come your way. It's from the first chapter of James and whether you are a religious person or not, I don't think it really matters. I think this applies. Um, we are in a state of, you know, that little bug that's down there in the picture is showing you that we has put us in a different state. Uh, than I think most of us have been used to, at least in my lifetime. Maybe some of you have suffered some things that are similar or, or can be uh, associated with it. But, um, you know, this has kind of set us back and it's made us really think about this. And to me, I like to look at everything that's, you know, I'd like to find something positive out of everything. Um, I've been spending a lot of time with my family. I've been redoing my office, uh, cleaned out my dental office, cleaned out my home office doing some projects around the house, have been going on walks with my family and working out every morning. So I hope you're taking advantage of this time to really connect with your families and spend some extra time with it. Um, but I do wanna talk about some different things, especially today's webinar. Hopefully uh, I can get you excited about a topic and get you going into something. Um, a little bit about me and my office. I feel it's always important to kind of speak about, you know, a lot of speakers come out and just tell you what to do, how to do it. But it's important that you know a little bit about me. Those are pictures of my office on the right. Um, the top one is our waiting room, which is going to look very much different than this as we come back to work. Um, if you've listened to any of the webinars from some of our other colleagues, Dr. Lou Graham has been one who's uh, talked about 
of seeing patients on emergencies. And even when we go back to our practices, if you get a chance, go ahead and look that up, uh, either in the Catapult site on Prexion or on Midway Dental. Um, he talks about how you should be seeing patients, what you should be doing with your waiting rooms and things like that. So some great stuff to treat, some great ways to be able to treat patients when you get back in. And hopefully we're getting back in soon. We just found out in Southern California that uh, we're off the, we don't even know what time. It was supposed to be at the end of uh, this week. Now we've been moved to either mid-May or end of May. So we're not quite sure yet. Um, anyway, uh, my office also on the bottom picture, you have uh, all the patients, all the operatories have a um, TV in front of them for the patient and a TV above them. I feel pictures are very important and I'll show you why in a minute. We have five team members. My overhead's at 57%. Um, it's very important. I talk business a lot. So um, I grew up in a business background. When I was 10 years old, I was involved in our family business. So um, I love dentistry, probably love it most, more than most people, but I also know it's a business and every business has to be looked at as that. And you have to kind of look at the business, understand what makes it work and how you can uh, make it better all the time and improve it. So I will talk about some business numbers as we go through this. One of them is having an overhead that's under 60%. Please make that your goal. Um, you should be able to tell these numbers from the AR reports that you get from your accountants. Um, also our fees um, and insurance and some of the procedures. Now I do have a couple of PPOs and I think some of this uh, pandemic is gonna be interesting to dealing with some of these PPOs and what they're gonna have to do because we are gonna have to charge a little bit extra for some of the PPEs that we're gonna be using. And hopefully they'll jump on and figure that out and be able to work with that. Um, California is a very PPO heavy state. There's not too many dentists that I know that don't take some sort of PPO in California. Uh, procedures. I tend to do most of my own surgeries, uh, most of my own treatments. I tend to also do ortho as well as uh, aligners, uh, as well as um, wires and brackets. And I also tend to do, I've been placing implants, like I said. One of the only things I send away tend to be molar endos. I, um, one of the things that we do a lot of in my office is we time every procedure. And if I'm doing a procedure where it's not profitable or it's taking too long, then that's a procedure that I probably should either need to get much faster at or just give it to somebody else. And those molar endos are one of the things that I tend to do that with. And I'll talk more about that later. Um, our competition, where my office is, that middle picture there that you see on the right, um, I have eight other general dental offices within 100 yards of me. Um, in San Diego as well, there's a little bit over 3 million people. And there is over 3,000 dentists. So if you do the math, that's about 1,000 people per dentist. And as I'm sure you all know, that not everybody goes to the dentist. So to say the competition is fierce would be an understatement. So a lot of people always ask me, how do you stand apart? Well, we have to do some things differently than other offices to hopefully make ourselves stand apart. And what are some of these things? How do we differentiate ourselves? I'm gonna give you a few tips and you know, whether you choose to use these or not, that's up to you, but these things work really well in our office. Every new patient of ours has these four pictures taken of them. Um, this allows our front office team to be able to talk to them about treatment. It also allows us to really be able to show them their teeth and make them understand what they're seeing. To me, a picture is worth a thousand words, it truly is. And so we try to show our pa patients as much as possible other than just telling them and then having question whether it's really happening or not. Um, so I don't actually walk into the operatory unless this particular picture of the retracted smile view is sitting right in front of the patient and I give them a chance to really stare at it for a few minutes. Um, and then when I walk in, I'm introduced to the patient. I try to talk to them about who referred them, what they do, things like that. But a lot of times when they have something like this and they haven't paid attention to it and they see their smile, they pick things out. In this particular uh, case, this lady was all over me asking about that canine. She's like, what are we going to do about that canine? Oh my gosh, I didn't realize it looked like that. It's darker. It's tucked in. It really looks horrible. I actually done here. I've actually gotten the patient to ask for some sort of cosmetic dentistry rather than me trying to push that throat. You know, this opens up a conversation on whether we want to talk about veneers or whether we're going to talk about some form of ortho. Um, she also found out, and I don't know how many of you saw it, but she has a little chip on the mesial buckle there of number uh, eight. So, you know, she's saying, oh, and I need to fix that chip. I didn't realize it was that big. 
The other thing that they tend to do, and this might be a Southern California thing and some of my Southern California people, but no matter how white or bright their teeth are on the screen, they always think they could use some more whitening. And that's why we wind up having about 70, 80% of our patients who tend to use some sort of whitening from our office. So these are a few little tidbits just to help you out with some cosmetic work once you get back into play. A couple of other things that we tend to do to differentiate ourselves is uh, we use a Cam X Triton HD camera. This camera has HD uh, uh, type photos it, it takes for us, um, as well as it has fluorescent technology and transillumination. So with these, again, we try to show patients pictures of everything they need in their mouth. It allows our front office team to really be able to talk to them and show them what we talk to them in the back. And they're also able to use some of these photos for third party for the insurances in case they don't pay you or something, because now we have pictures of everything. Um, the fluorescence, my hygienist tend to take time and explain to them what they mean and show them that there's a cavity in there and what the colors mean and everything. And trans illumination, for those of you that have carry view, you understand how that works. It's without radiation, you're able to see interproximal decay or different things that are happening within their teeth. So again, differentiating ourselves from others, all this happens within one camera. Um, and we also use a CBCT. We use the Prexion CBCT, and I'll be talking more about that later as we go. But we tend to use this every day for all patients essentially, and especially for implants, as we'll talk about a little bit later here as we get into. Um, from an implant survey, there are top three reasons why most dentists don't currently place implants, according to research, that is. The first one is fear. A lot of people have the fear of the unknown. You know, it looks daunting. You know, what am I going to do with it? Uh, just to be able to go cut into the mouth and do some different things. But I think the more you learn and the more you educate yourself, hopefully some of that will go away because knowledge is the other one. They don't have the knowledge on this topic. Um, you tend to kind of say, I don't, I'm not sure about this. That's why I really encourage you. And, and if you are not placing implants, by all means, take more courses. Um, that's exactly what I did because I was getting really frustrated with some of the patients that were coming back to me from specialists. You know, the specialists were in there and I would send them patients and I would tell them, take your time, build the bone, give me that implant in an ideal place. And they'd send them back to me and the implant would be like this or, you know, like that. And they tell me, oh yeah, use an angled abutment. Well, I didn't want to use an angled abutment. So I got mad enough to where I said, um, you know, if anybody's going to screw this up, it's going to be me. So I took that upon myself to start taking courses. And then I took um, live patient hands-on where I placed implant on patients. And I'll discuss that more as we go. But that was part of the reason why I, I got into it. Also the fact that I'm always craving new things. I think I get a little bit bored in my office and wanna try something new and try to learn something new all the time. Um, it allows you for growth, it allows you for confidence, which this will too. A lot of times people don't have confidence in placing the implant. Um, but I always tell, remind everyone, do you remember the first time you did a crown in dental school? Your confidence level was probably not the highest that day. I'm sure there were a lot of sweaty armpits. I hate even mentioning it because people it'll go, people put it back in their heads and go back to that time. But, you know, it took two, three hours that day. The more you do implants as well, your confidence is going to grow. You're going to get better and better with this. So remember that. That's basically how I did it too. And remember that change is very important for us. You know, um, if we don't adapt, if we're not growing, you know, what's the opposite of growth? That's, that's you know, not something that you want to think about. But change is good. It makes you think outside the box. It makes you grow your business, grow your office, grow yourself personally as well. Um, you know, it, all great change is um, preceded by chaos. Well, I can think of no better chaos than the state we're in right now. So if there's ever a time to think about changing or adding some new procedures to your office, this probably is not a bad one to be in right now. So why do we want to do implants? Um, you know, according to the AAID um, of 2017, they had a few different reasons in there why dentists might want to do implants. There's more than 30 million people in the U.S. that are missing all their teeth in one or both arches. Um, so there's a good population to choose from. That's a good chunk of people to choose from. Um, also, you know, that is growing by about 500,000 a year and more. And the fact that the implant market is projected to reach 4.2 billion by 2020, um, that gives us a lot of reasons to be able to want to do implant, besides the fact of some of the other things that I talked about, of growth and confidence and some of the other things that you will gain from doing this. Um, also, only about 15% of U.S. dentists are placing dental implants right now. I'm always thinking as a business that, you know, we should be doing things that other businesses aren't. 
we don't want to be a commodity, which like the physicians have basically become. The last thing I want to do is make my office just any other office. I want them to remember us for who we are. I want them to remember our name, to remember how unique we are from other offices as well. So this kind of does that because we're able to keep our patients in office and let them stay in. I, I don't know if I can tell you how valuable that is when a patient can stay in one office and get most of their treatment done. They love that. They hate actually having to go to other offices to get things done. Um, so why implant dentistry? Like I said, it's one of the most rewarding treatments in dentistry for both the patient and you emotionally, professionally, and financially, which we'll talk about here in a little bit. Um, again, the more knowledge you gain, the more confidence you gain. Um, it also lets you think more. It gets you outside that box. And, you know, until you've placed hundreds of these, then it kind of makes it a little bit where you've done, you know, where it becomes, where you're not thinking about it as much. But a lot of times it's fun planning and, and treatment planning these cases. Um, it's also one of the most successful procedures in dentistry, 90 plus success rate. So I, I do want to ask you guys, if you do start implant dentistry and start placing them, please try and keep that success rate way up there by really learning what you're going to do and doing it very well. Um, okay, so let's talk a little bit about profitability. So in the US, the average of the implants is around 1800. Um, like I said, it's average. In your, some areas it may be higher, some areas it may be lower. In addition to that cost, there's also the abutment, the graft. So the total is usually around 4,000 somewhere. So if you do uh, one implant per week on 50 implants per year, that's going to wind up being somewhere around 200,000. So let's say you don't do that in the first year and you do just half of that. If you did 25 implants or if you're the average and do that 25 implants maybe, well, that's still an extra 100,000 to your production. Even if you did half of that where you did one implant a month, you know, that's not bad if you're getting about 50 extra thousand in production added to your implant and added to your regular production. So um, when you think about this, three hours of work, which is what the general average is, and to be honest with you, when it's a single unit, a lot of times it winds up being less than that as you get more proficient in this. Compare that to the average composite procedure hourly production, which is around 250 per hour. Uh, I think that 1333 speaks volume into what, how you could change what you do in your office. It may make you think about some of the procedures that you do more or less in your office, okay? And then there's Gordon Christensen. It's funny, whenever I mention his name, it's sort of like the old E.F. Hutton commercials. Everybody kind of quiets down. Well, he says that general dentists should be placing about 50% of all implants, where at least half the procedures are done by the general dentist, the more difficult procedures can be done by a specialist. So you don't have to do them all. You can cherry pick, pick the easier ones to start at first. Um, when I speak in my other courses and the longer two day courses, I, I really go into detail. But one of the tips I always tell people is, you know, start out, always start out in the posterior, try to do about 20 implants in the posterior before even thinking about anything in the anterior. Um, I had a young lady dentist who was in my course and she was taking it. And she said that she'd already taken an implant course and placed the implants. And I said, oh, how did it go? She said, well, the first implant I placed in my office was on tooth number nine. And so I asked, oh, well, how did that go? She's like, well, that's why I'm taking your class right now. <laughs> so um, get comfortable in the posterior before you move to the anterior is my big thing when you start this. Also start on uh, friends and family. In-laws are great people to do it on. You know, those are, you know, by all means, one of my, one of my brother-in-laws actually, I have like two or three implants in him. Um, but they're great people to do. And if you have to do some of them pro bono, which is free basically when you first start, that's okay because that's a place where you're learning. And you know, that way you take more time and you can be more, you can be a little less stressed when you're doing it like that and not have to worry about what you have to do with a patient. So keep that in mind as well. Um, the hopeful man sees success where others see failure, sunshine where others see shadows and storms. I know this is a dark time, but I always think that, you know, let's try to learn things when we're in downtime. And I've been doing that a lot with some of the webinars that I watch. And hopefully you're doing that with some of the things you're learning. And I hope the implants become one of them. So keep that in mind, something to grow on. Um, let's talk a little bit about the earliest implants. Implants have been around for a while. Um, ancient Egyptians, actually, 2000 BC, were using shells and ivory. Uh, to replace missing teeth. So this concept has been around for a real long time. Um, you know, the Mayans were doing it, the Romans were doing different things. Uh, but in 1951-52 is when Brandenmark really came in. He's an orthopedic surgeon who basically um, discovered how titanium fuses with bone. And um, 
I'll talk a little bit about him in a second, but I want to show you a couple of different types of implants that have been out there for a while. Intramucosal implants are basically seated on mucosa only. Um, if you can see them on the right picture there. Um, transosteal, those penetrate through the entire cortex of bone. So those can be a little interesting. Not sure if you've ever seen them in your practices or not. Uh, I think they can be quite messy and quite a bit of work too. Uh, then there's subperiosteal, which are, frame, which are the frames where they seat on the bone. But the ones we're going to talk about, which are more common today, are the endosteal implants. And those are the ones that stay within bone. They're root form type implants. Um, they're designed to really mimic a root. They're designed to have, be able to be loaded and have that bidirectional loading and distribution similar to your other teeth to make things about as natural as possible. So what's the difference between an implant and an actual tooth? Um, really the biggest thing is that there's no um, connective tissue and there's no PDL. Otherwise, once it's in there, most of the other things are gonna be similar to a natural tooth because you'll have a crown in there that's gonna be similar, but there is no CT and there's no PDL on it. Those are the two biggest differences that you'll have. Uh, I mentioned Professor Vandermark in 1951-52. Um, came up with the phenomenon of osteointegration basically how bone and titanium fused together and um, became together and adhered together. And that's where the, our modern day implants basically started from. Success rate is typically around 90% or higher. And, and please, whenever I teach my courses, I'm always telling people, I want you to learn it so well that you keep that percentage rate way up there. There's not too many things in medicine that are 90% or higher. I always speak with my physician friends and we always have this argument. They always say that. They're like, yeah, we don't have too many things that are 90% successful. So I like to keep that up there. Um, four factors that influence implant osteointegration is how biocompatible the material is. Um, the implant adapting to the actual prepared site, whether it's a uh, atraumatic surgery, and I'll show you a case of that a little bit later, and how undisturbed the healing phase is. Um, so why dental implants? Or why do they make more sense? So um, times have really changed. I think we've moved away, a lot of patients have moved away from the uh, partial dentures, the full dentures, and even bridges. A lot of them come into our offices nowadays asking for implants. They've already done their research, and they're like, okay, I want to look into this implant. You know, I, I've been looking into it and I want to see if I'm a candidate, if I'm able to. It's no longer where, really, where we're really actually educating them on this. A lot of them already know about it coming into our practices. And they're more demanding of more advanced treatments. Um, you know, a lot of times these patients are coming in and thanks to the internet, <laughs> they're, they're getting their homework done. And so they're asking for different treatments that we have. So this kind of pushes us to be able to stay on top of these different advances in treatment modalities. Um, it's a very safe and common treatment. We talked about how successful, the, the, how successful they are. And if done right, and if the cases are chosen correctly, and also when you don't try to step out of your comfort zone too quickly, um, you know, they can be very, very successful. Um, the fact that they function and feel like natural teeth, you know, we're constantly telling our um, patients how they actually do feel like natural teeth. And a lot of times the patients, you know, I always ask my patients who have dentures or partials, I always tell them, when was the last time you had a steak? And they kind of look at you like, oh yeah, I, I don't eat too many steaks. I'm like, well, how would you like to? And they're like, what do you mean? And that starts a little conversation sometimes of, hey, let's talk about implants. Um, saving healthy teeth. I think this is the most conservative treatment. I really have a hard time ever uh, prepping abutments that are completely healthy. I've actually had a patient one time, in my office what we try to do also is um, we try to keep a implant uh, procedure uh, cost-wise to be the same as a three unit bridge. So if I can take the price out of the equation, then my only issue typically is the time issue because implants do take a little bit longer than doing a three unit bridge but I try to convince them how much longer they last, how much easier they are to clean with and things like that. But I, I did have a patient um, just this past year where we gave them all the benefits of both and, and they still were choosing to do a bridge and both teeth were healthy abutments. And I told them, I just couldn't do it. I go, you know, I can't cut healthy abutments anymore. I'm like, uh, that's just, you're not making a good decision there. You might have to see somebody else. I told them there's eight others right around me. So to go ahead and try that there. Um, Lifelong solution. This is something that can last a really long time for them. You know, it, there's different studies, say 15 plus years, etc. 
So these can last a long time, or a lot of the studies tend to say five to seven or seven to nine years for most bridges. And I think it does improve their quality of life and self-confidence. Anytime you place implants on somebody who had, uh, who's had missing teeth for a while, or if they've had partials or dentures, it really does improve their quality of life and show them, and they show the confidence. Um, let's talk a little bit about case selection. You know, are you replacing one or more teeth as single units? We definitely do that. So we can support a bridge or eliminate the need for a partial denture. Um, a lot of times when I talk to patients, you know, people are always asking me, where do I get these implant patients? The best place to start is your own patients. I'm sure your own patient pool, there is plenty of bridges in there, which are either going to fail or are failing, or people who have partials or people who have dentures. Most of these are great, your own patients, and they have all this trust and faith in you. So when you tell them that you're now placing implants, most of the time they're gonna be like, great, I don't have to go somewhere else, we can just do it here. So keep that in mind when you're looking for patients. Don't jump on doing ads and things like this right away and get into costly things. Start with your own patient pool. Um, they provide support for dentures, making it might, much more comfortable, much more able to eat different things, much stronger in their mouth, a lot less movement. Also, the fact that they prevent bone loss and gum recession, especially in some of these older patients where you start to see their bone just becoming basically nothing and they start having these knife edge little bone areas. And I'll show you some pictures of some of these later, but um, it can really hold up the bone levels there for a long time for you, just like teeth would. Um, patient confidence we talked about and speaking and overall psychological health. A lot of people, you'll tend to see it in patients where they're like, yeah, this feels great. It feels like my own teeth. I never have to think about them again. Um, and an improved aesthetics, obviously, of the teeth and the mouth. So what's our clinical, what's our circle of success? Well, there's a few things that we want to kind of go over. Just um, we don't have time to go over all the details, but I'm going to give you some highlights of certain things to kind of look for. Um, clinical data, that's very important. You know, you want to make sure p patients are, um, you're looking at your patients, you're looking at what kind of a candidate they are. Um, and there, if there's any limitations to them as well, you know, I always tell people don't look at every patient that has a missing tooth as a dollar sign. I always tell them, look at their teeth. You know, if they have teeth that they're not taking care of their teeth right now and they're failing, you know, find out why, because this may not be a great candidate. If they can't keep their own teeth healthy, that what makes us think that they're going to keep the implants healthy. Uh, and sometimes I have these patients and I show these pictures of them later that, you know, they have a horrible looking mouth and they come in and yeah, I want implants all over my entire mouth. They look at them going, you're ready to spend that much money when you couldn't even take care of these teeth. So keep that in mind a little bit. Um, sometimes what we do with those patients is we'll tell them, let's clean up your teeth and give you, you know, three or four month recall, see how you come back and let's see how you do. If you're going to start taking care of these teeth, then by all means, you're gonna be a good candidate and we can proceed with implants, but we don't want you to waste your money and your time as well. Um, radiographic interpretation, very, very important because we're gonna go through that and how you need to look at a CBCT and how, a, um, how that's really gonna drive a lot of your treatment, make your treat treatment really easy when you start using it correctly. Confidence level, I think the more you go and the more you do in terms of implants, the more your confidence grows and the more you start reaching for techniques and things that are a, a little bit more um, out there for you. Um, limitations, you know, know your comfort level at first, understand where you're going and be able to execute, you know, you have a treatment plan, have it done. Um, in my office, typically I'll spend about 15, 20 minutes just kind of planning a case on the CBCT. And if I need to, I'll actually, I, I rarely do it anymore, but I used to all the time draw out the anatomic, uh, the anatomical parts in the CT, but I'll show you that. But after a while, you do 10 to 15 minutes of planning with that. When you go in for the actual surgery, it's typically like a half an hour, 40 minutes, and you're usually done with a surgery. So spend more time planning than anything else. That way you kind of get in there and you're able to do it, not have to think about it while you're working. Um, let's talk about the bone evaluation. Um, the bone describes, you know, the dentalist area that's to be considered for the implant site. And what are some of the things that we want to look at? Uh, well, height, obviously. Um, width is one of those things where if you don't have a CT, you really won't know how much width you have. So I'll, we'll talk a lot about that and show you some different things with a CT. Um, a lot of this is taken care of by using uh, a CT scan and being able to tell the width, the length, the height of these uh, different areas. Excuse me, angulations and undercuts as well. 
You want to look at crown to implant body ratio. As we get further posterior in the mandible, especially, um, that nerve starts to come up and you start having less and less bone area. Is this an area where you should be grafting or perhaps you want to use a wider implant that's maybe shorter? Those are all considerations you have to look at and they become second nature the more you do this. So I just like to bring them up to you so you understand them all here as we go along. Um, conditions of the remaining teeth. You know, how do the rest of their teeth look like? Like I said, evaluate the patient. I always look at every patient from CEJ to ECG, CEJ. And if I'm doing a single tooth between that, I wanna see where this is, how it's gonna look in their smile. Um, we'll get into that a little bit more. An amount of keratinized tissue how much tissue do they actually have and how is this going to be in terms of, especially if it's an anterior area, are you going to be able to mend this tissue and get it working to where it starts to look like it's coming out of the mouth? Because you want these to look as natural as possible and as healthy as possible once you're done restoring them. Um, now pay attention to this one because I'm going to quiz you on the next slide here. So this is amount of available bone width. Um, I always recommend at least one to two millimeters of bone should be remaining after the implant placement to any anatomical structures. If it's the mental foramen, I usually recommend two or more millimeters away. Um, that's the one area in the mouth where I'll be honest with you that I really pay close attention to because I've seen that mental nerve do some different things around that area. But again, those are things that you can pick out in your CT scan. So remember, you want to stay at least one to two millimeters away from most anatomical structures. Um, you know, I usually go into anatomical structures for about two hours, so obviously we're not going to do that today, but I'm just going to give you some generalities here. Um, two millimeters, you want to be from tooth to implant. You want to have at least two millimeters, ideally, between tooth to implant. You want to have enough bone for that papilla to grow nicely. You also want to have enough, uh, you want to also have enough vasculature for that implant to heal and grow and for the bone to fuse with it. And you want to have three millimeters between implant to implant. Those are some big numbers to remember. So remember that as I show you this, and typically in my classes, I kind of quiz a lot, so I'll we'll try to keep you in, in, uh, interested and keeping your head in the game, but uh, what's the minimum total amount of space needed for this case? Remember some of the things I just showed you, and I, I know this is a little hard to do with a webinar and you're not, we have you on mute, but um, remember that you wanna have two and three millimeters, three millimeters between implants, two millimeters between tooth to implant. So if you do all the math here, basically you'd need about 24 millimeters here. I hope you all got that. So um, that's some of the math you have to do in some of these cases, because then you have to decide, okay, look at the different lengths of these implants as well. You know, sometimes you need to avoid that maxillary sinus. Um, sometimes you can angle these a little bit differently, so you may have to go with not such a wide implant. These are some of the things that you have to play with as you kind of start treatment planning and going through. And here's a little bit of a, a hint here as we go through this particular slide. Um, let's talk a little bit about bone. Again, uh, there's four different types of bone in the mouth. I won't go through into the many slides I have on the classifications. Uh, the Mish classification, Dr. Mish's classifications of them, but I do want to show you a couple of things in terms of um, quantity and quality of the bone. Um, the green areas show that it's very good, mainly good quality and quantity. That lower anterior area is probably the best area to place implants in because of the quantity and quality of the bone typically. Um, the yellow area means that the quantity is frequently insufficient, but that the quality is mainly good. It's not as good as the green, but it's mainly good. Um, and then the red area, the quantity and the quality are usually problematic. And that's because of the type of bone it is. It tends to be a little bit spongy. A lot of times the sinus comes into play. There are some different things which come into play with that that you have to think about and, and work with. So those are some things, considerations to have. Um, what are some considerations for a posterior single tooth implant? And what are some of the advantages of it? Well, obviously longevity. Uh, I'll show you a study here in a little bit that shows the differences between a bridge and an actual uh, and implant placement itself. So improved aesthetics, that's obvious whether it's, you know, anywhere in the posterior that may show in your smile. Maintenance of bone in the dentalist region, um, you get to keep that bone solid. The teeth next, the neighboring teeth won't start to collapse in that area. They won't start losing bone, whether it's on their distal or mesial sides. Psychological advantage, we talked about that. Patients won't have any teeth missing. Uh, better chewing efficiency is another one. As we age also, one of the things that tends to happen is a lot of people tend to have issues with, um, with um, 
some of their, their stomach problems and they tend to have, they're not able to chew food quite as well. One of the things I talk about with my patients is I want you to have as good as efficiency chewing as possible. So um, what are some of the disadvantages of this? Single tooth implant. Well, you have an extended treatment time. To me, that's really about the biggest one. Uh, because if the patient is considering a bridge versus an implant, we try to keep the price, like I said, about the same, but the time is the only difference. So what I try to tell them is, look, I know it's going to take a little bit longer, but imagine how much better it's going to be overall for you over time. You won't have to have this procedure redone as you probably would with a bridge. Um, I put cost in there because sometimes people have, you know, decide to go with a partial or a denture and it can be a little bit of a cost difference for that. But I also remind them how often dentures have to be realigned, how much more work has to be done with them, and how often they have to be replaced as well. Um, here's a little bit of the cost discussion that we talked about a little bit. On the left, the top there, you see the implant supported crown. On the right, you see a tooth supported bridge. And I also bring to your, um, I want you to look at the idea that, you know, replacement costs at 10 years or at 20 years, the replacement costs for bridges will tend to be more and more over time. Um, how long they last, you know, we said, depending on which studies you read, bridges five to seven, sometimes seven to nine years, depending on who's doing the study. Um, implants 15 years plus, many times longer. Um, insurance coverage, I know I put rarely covered in there. That's based on all insurances. Most of the indemnity and PPO insurances tend to cover these, but there's also a lot of other insurances that aren't indemnity and PPO, and those are the ones that don't tend to cover them quite as much. Um, Long-term dental health, obviously little to, no or bone, little to no bone or gum loss. And while the bridge will have some bone and gum loss, and typically that's the space underneath the bridges and they get more food caught in there. And usually the oral hygiene, if they're not using those special brushes and floss, that's where they wind up having problems and some of these bridges tend to fail. Like I said, the biggest issue I tend to find is the procedure duration, multiple visits over three to six months at times whereas a bridge is two to three visits over, you know, two to three weeks. So, uh, but as long as you give them the benefits of the implants, I think that's usually a, not a sticking point. <laughs> Anterior single tooth replacement, factors influencing treatment. Obviously patients age, if they're young and they lose their teeth or an accident or something happens, then you can't place it till they're older and they're adults. Um, patient desires, you know, sometimes I get these patients that come in and they're, you know, they've been missing teeth for like 20 years and they're telling you, oh, I want this and I want this and I have this and they had their tissue is horrible. They have no bone. And so you have to kind of, you know, talk to them about their expectations and, and their abilities and what you can do and how much more involved it's going to be to be able to get tissue there and to build the bone there as well. Um, patient compliance, patient fear. It's interesting. Um, patient fear is an interesting one. I have my own sister who's been needing like an implant forever and her husband, I placed three implants in his mouth and yet she's still afraid to come do this. Um, so what I always don't like is like having the wives that push their husbands into having an implant procedure. I want everybody to be comfortable with this before they come in and do it. The last thing I want is somebody that doesn't want to be there, is terrified, and I'm having to sit there and work on them because of the partner told them to go do this. Um, cost is an influencing factor, obviously, and that's something we talked about. Um, transitional prosthesis, you know, um, depending on what you're doing, whether this winds up being a flipper or you wind up having a temp placed on the abutment and things like that, where you're helping with the healing and trying to get that tissue just right. Um, some of these are considerations you have to have when you're doing anterior implants, and sometimes the cost of those can be a little bit more. Um, also, aesthetics, obviously, is a big factor on whether um, they have a low smile line as well. Um, so let's talk about requirements for implants, fixed restorations. If you're missing one tooth, obviously you need in one implant. If you're missing two teeth, typically two. Uh, missing teeth, three missing teeth is going to be two or three teeth. Four missing teeth, it's going to be two, three, or four implants. Now, in a full arch bridge, uh, an edentulous maxilla, you want at least six implants. Um, and a full arch bridge on an edentulous mandible, you want at least four implants. Over dentures in an edentulous maxilla, you want at least four. I say at least because there's cases where I plan on having a case on, uh, on four implants. And then I, sometimes I'll put in a fifth. I usually won't charge the patient for it. When you're doing a case that big, the cost of one more implant is really nothing. Um, you want to add that in just to have as a safety net, as a backup, so you don't wind up really slowing down your treatment. And um, I, I show that in some of the other courses that we talk about and talk about it more. I won't be able to do it as much today, but I'll show you some things here coming up. Um, edentulous mandible, you want at least two implants in there. 
All right, so we talked a lot. So now let's show you a couple of clinical cases. Um, this was Janet, she's a hygienist, she's my hygienist mom. Um, she had come in a number of years ago. She came in with her bridge that had come off and a healing uh, molar tooth there on the right. And um, also the tooth, the premolar there was fractured. So my first question to her was, um, what happened, whoops, what happened with your um, implant? Why is it buried under your bridge and why were you not using it? And I got the death stare from her because she said to me that, hey, I had paid for this implant. What do you mean it wasn't being used? Well, her implant was basically covered down there in tissue, if you can see, and was no part of her fixed bridge at all. So after talking her down and calming her down, we, we try to figure out which implant this was, because as you can see, it, it's pretty solid in there. It's been there for a number of years and it's never really been used. Um, but the office where she went and had the work done was closed. So we couldn't find the dentist. We couldn't find any information. We eventually found out that that was a three eye implant and we were gonna try to work with it. Um, this is an upper right bridge that had come off. And so we had, we had placed two implants around that particular implant and we were gonna work with that. There are gonna be a couple of different implants in there. But you can see that she has a fairly nice mouth overall and she does a good job of her teeth, but this was an area that's failing. And I'll tell you about the upper left side in a moment here in a second, as you see it in that slide. Um, so we do some laser troughing around the implants and we um, take a full mouth impression. I always take a full mouth impression when I'm, whenever I'm doing two or more implants. Uh, if it's a single implant, I try to take a impression that goes at least to the opposing canine. One of the main reasons I do that is I want the labs to do all the excursion work and all the work there for me rather than me having to do it in the mouth and adjusting and going back and forth. I want my, my visit to be very quickly the day I give them their implant crown. Um, so we wind up placing the implants and we worked with that implant that she currently have. Uh, wound up having some great bone support there. Built her up real nicely. Um, so that came out real nice. And as you can see in this picture and her photo on the right, the implants even cleared up her face a little bit, <laughs> made her lose some weight, it looks like. Um, but, you know, so this is a nine year post-op on her that's been going on. And now, unfortunately, we are treating the other side because it has the same exact thing as the right side did. There's an implant placed in there and there, there's a fixed bridge over that where the implant is not being used. Um, so, you know, I told her, I go, hey, you got to use these implants, even though you paid somebody else for them, I still managed to keep them. It's not like I'm taking out these implants. I'm still using them. She's just getting them done many years after they were initially placed. Um, this is what her CBCT looked like and her pano. Um, this is an interesting case. This was probably about three, four months ago. Uh, it was a, I call it the Thursday lunch. Uh, this patient had originally, was originally coming in to have that tooth number 10, which has a temporary on it, um, it's supposed to be having a crown placed on it. So he walks in, my assistant walks in, and she tells me, uh, we've got a problem. And this was right before lunchtime, of course, you know, when these things always happen. Uh, and she says, uh, he fractured the other lateral. And I said, ah, so, you know, I kind of looked at it. I went in, I, I went in to talk to him. And he says to me, he's like, oh, gosh, doc. He said, the same exact thing happened to my brother. He had to go to one office for them to take it out, another place to go get, a, to go get an x-ray, like a big x-ray on it. And then he had to go back to his office to get the crown done and all this stuff. I said, well, you know what? You're in luck today. We're not gonna work on that crown that we were gonna place uh, cement permanently, but we're gonna work on this today. Um, so the longest part of this procedure is um, taking out that, that current root atraumatically. You have to really take your time with that because the buccal bone, bone really sets the tone. If you break that, that's going to become a much more involved procedure. It's going to involve a lot more grafting, a lot more things that you're going to have to do. Um, but by being atraumatic and taking that out, placing it on the side, you can actually measure that to decide what size implant you want. Typically the implant you're gonna place in there is gonna be either a little bit longer or a little bit wider um, so that you can place it in there. It's slightly wider or longer as you can see in there so you can get a few more threads inside the tooth and be able to place that. But we were able to place an implant in that day. And then we placed our bone graft around that area. So we graft the buccal as well as the lingual around that implant. Then we place our membrane and then we suture that down and give him a temporary in there. So he came in looking like this and he kind of, uh, he comes in with his x-ray and then he comes out 
with something like that. So everybody always wants to know prices. So that, that one hour or so that we took during lunchtime um, was about 265 for the extraction, CT was 285, the bone graft was 485, the implant was 1685. But getting it all done in one office was priceless to that patient. And he was so excited, he was like, oh my gosh, I'm gonna go tell my brother about this. So, you know, and that's not a bad lunch. And I even had time for a quick turkey sandwich too, so. <laughs> But that's a great thing to have and the ability to do that in one office and having your patients be able to stay and you can do this, you know, you take, you, you're able to start from A to Z to do this. Um, let me go into a little bit about making things as simple as possible, but not simpler, as Einstein said. Um, I think one of the easiest things and one of the, the things that's made implant surgery so much easier has been surgical guides. A surgical guide can really, uh, honestly, like I, there is a video that I show in my other courses where I literally close my eyes and I have a surgical guide on a patient. We place six implants in. And once I place the drill inside the surgical guide, I actually close my eyes at time because the, the, surge, the, the um, burr has a stop on it. I'm in a surgical guide. I know exactly where I'm going. It's just to prove a point how, how simple surgical guides can make placing implants. Um, anyway, multiple implants, you should always use a guide. Two or more implants in a row, you should use a guide. And also, if you're having a single implant in it for extreme accuracy, if you're in a tight area, or if you're around some anatomic structures where you want to make sure you're working correctly, absolutely use a surgical guide. Um, I try to teach both ways. I teach the surgical guide method as well as freehanding, flapless, and flap surgeries. So um, this way you'll learn everything from A to Z. And if you ever have issues, you can take care of it. But surgical guides allow you to have precise implant placement. Um, they're really great in that they less risk of compromising adjacent vital structures that we talked about. They enable flapless surgery, which is huge. But I always have my patients back a week after we do a surgery. And the thing that I was asking is, how did it go? What did you think about the implant surgery? And they always look at me and go, gosh, the, you know, the, the extraction was worse than this. And you even numbed me more for the extraction. And I'm like, okay, well, that's what I want to hear. So make sure you tell all your friends that because that means the flapless surgery is very easy and, and very little. Most of the time, I, I rarely even give antibiotics on a lot of healthy situations unless I'm doing bone grafts and things like that. Uh, so let's show you a little bit of guided surgery using the CBCTs because this can make your life truly easy and can really help you out in what you do. Um, radiographic imaging is obviously the backbone of accuracy in implantology. You have to have great radiography in order to be able to do implants. Um, periapicals and, and uh, pano x-rays, you know, I know they're fast and inexpensive, but they're only two-dimensional. They're nowhere near as accurate. CT scans are the standard of care, especially in implants, and they're also the standard of safety. Um, they're very accurate, multi-dimensional, and um, God forbid you ever have an issue with a court case. Uh, the first thing they ask you if you're placing implants is, did you have a CT? So a CT is the very minimum you have to have when you're doing these. Um, I think this picture on the lower right here is great, just to kind of show you, even nowadays, as we have emergencies and things like that, I think taking a CT scan on a patient is going to be much be better, cleaner, easier for us than having our uh, assistants go in and take PAs or, you know, bite wings or even full mouths if they're new patients. Um, this is a much cleaner procedure especially now with the coronavirus, I'm trying to keep a lot of that to a minimum. Um, this is one of the things this is talked about by a lot of our colleagues and, and how we should be treating patients and what we should be doing. So make sure you're paying attention to this. And if you do have a CT, absolutely use it as much as possible in the next coming months. Um, here's another little study that talks about PAs versus CBCTs. The result of this study talks about that intraoral PAs would only allow clear identification of lesions 25% of the time whereas a 3D CBCT imaging revealed the lesion 100% of the time. So accuracy is huge and very important here. Uh, what is CBCT? I've been using that term a lot. Well, it stands for cone beam computed tomography. It was introduced into the market in 1996 into Europe. Uh, it came to the United States in 2001. I believe it's the most significant technological advancement there is in imaging. It's the ability to really truly diagnose. It's the ah and the aha that you find um, your patients are going to be odds, uh, are going to be odd, and you're going to say, aha, when you just find things that other dentists can't find because you're using a CT. Um, accuracy of the information is about 0.1 millimeter. You are able to get extremely accurate three-dimensional 
uh, image of the site you're working at. You're able to access not only bone, but infections, decay. You can see all these vital anatomic structures. You can draw out nerves, uh, bone concavities. You can see where everything is and really have a great idea of where you're working before you go into an area. It also has the ability to use uh, the simulated implant placements, and I'll show you some of these in a second. Uh, the Prexion software is great for that. They have most of the large implant company softwares in there, so you can actually place the implant, look at it, change sizes, make it longer, wider, whatever you want before you actually do the surgery. And you can also base your um, surgical guide based on that as well. For those of you that have digital impressioning uh, capabilities, CAD CAM, CBCT, um, not CBCT, sorry, CAD CAM, you're able to super pose some of these STL files and really get a great idea of hard tissue and soft tissue and plan your restorations out as well. So cone beam versus pano. Um, a pano, if you can imagine a number of these letter cards being stacked up amongst on top of each other being superimposed, uh, that's sort of what a pano does. It superimposes all this material, but there winds up being about 25 to 30% distortion because you're looking at a flat image and you're missing a lot of detail. The difference with the CBCT is that you can take each one of these slices individually and look at it really cleanly and be able to look at it in 3D and turn it in every which way to kind of understand and see what's going on with it. Some of the other limitations of 2D, as you can see, we can all see that the woman is holding a pineapple in her hand there, but not having that other view at third dimension, we were not able to see that she's holding a banana in the other hand. And do we need more views? Well, I think we do, because in this particular one, the prince looks like he's being a little mean to his reporters. <laughs> um, but when you actually look at him from an AP view, he's actually just still speaking. So I, I do think we need more views, and it really makes sense in the implant world. Um, when to use the implants in, CB, in CBCT in day-to-day -day dentistry? By the way, I did a lecture on this uh, a couple of days ago and went into a lot more detail on how to use CBCT in your day-to-day -day and showed all these different uh, things that I'm going to list here in detail and showed cases of them. If you get a chance, by all means, go back and look up Prexion and look up these, um, the other webinar that we did two days ago. But obviously, you can use cone beam for implant placement. Um, cone beam for endo treatment diagnosis. I used to always send my CTs to my endodontist and tell them, hey, this uh, molar has an MB2, make sure you fill it. <laughs> he really enjoyed listening to that. <laughs> Eventually, he got his own CT. And most of the endodontists, like I mentioned, uh, pretty much all have CTs now because they understand in order to be able to see what these canals look like, how many there is, how they're turning, or whether do apicos, they really do need a CT as well. Um, cone beam for uh, decay diagnosis, and I show lots of slides in that in the other webinars. So uh, third molar extractions to evaluate them, whether you decide to take them out yourself or whether you want to put the patient into sedation mode and, and, and uh, take them out or whether you want to refer them. Uh, you're really able to truly see, and I'll show you some of that in 3D, how you can uh, decide whether you want to keep them or not. For those of you that do TMJ treatment diagnosis, there's some great shots in there that'll show you those. Apicoectomies, as I mentioned, the diagnosis and treatment planning of impacted teeth, and whether you do ortho not or ortho planning, um, this is very important. Yet you're able to see where these teeth are, whether it's to you know take out crowded teeth or to help the orthodontist place them in the correct position, or whether you're doing the ortho yourself. Uh, Perio diagnosis and treatment planning as well. Um, grafting procedure I think is a no-brainer for any of you who aren't doing that. Absolutely, most any teeth outside of wisdom teeth should be grafted. That way, you get the patient the opportunity to actually still be able to get an implant, whether they do it at the time or down the line. Um, so do that. That's an increase in your production as well. Cone beam for treating airways. It, the the Prexion CBCT is fantastic for that. They have a software that's built into it that allows you to understand and see how much air volume they have, airway volume they have. It'll color it out for you. It'll, you can measure the area. A lot of times I look at my new patients and once I've looked at the scan, I go in there and I ask them, I go, how do you sleep? How do you sleep at night? Do you sleep okay? And they look at you like, wow, he knows something about me. And then we get into this conversation of airway and uh, sleep apnea and things. I'm not diagnosing, but I'm starting them in a, in a down the road of, hey, let's get a sleep study and think about whether we send you to an ENT um, or somewhere to start looking at this more seriously. But the, the Combeam CBCT does have that, so it's fantastic for that. Um, new patient exams. All our new patients, we do actually take a CT scan. Um, sometimes the children, maybe sometimes not, but a lot of these, even with the FMXs, 
Average FMX is about 170 microsieverts. The average cone beam that we take is gonna be a lot less. I'm gonna show you that here in just a second. So you'll see that it's usually like half or less. So we're actually radiating them less and getting way more information. And by having a CBCT, you get to see a lot more things that are failing in their mouth than you ever thought possible. Um, let me show you, oh, there we go. So let's understand some terminology and field of view. I know I'm running late a little bit. I told you, Tim, I had a lot of information. So <laughs> I'm getting through it here. Uh, field of view and some image components. Coronal is looking at a CBCT from front to back. Axial is one of the best views because you're looking from top to bottom. You can slice a tooth every which way you want, even into the contact area. So you can actually truly see if there is decay in those contacts. Um, as well as being able to see the width of the bone, which is a, a great thing for implants. Sagittal is side to side. You're able to kind of cut through the tooth, you know, cut through the face and, and slices from side to side. Now, what sizes do this particular um, CBCT have? So you can have different sizes. Some people always tell me, well, I don't want to look at the whole mouth and be responsible for it. Um, you can do a five by five of just the area you're working in. A lot of times endodontists tend to use this field as well. It's very effective for endo, or if you just want to do an area that you're just doing a single implant in. Um, I'll be honest with you, most of the time we take the um, 10 by 8 vision because that's very comprehensive, allows us to treatment plan well, um, allows us to do implant surgeries, and we're able to diagnose uh, TMJ as well. Um, now, the 15 by 13 is great for um, airway, for TMJ analysis, ortho. Um, and a lot of times, you know, depending on what our patients sign in and fill out our patient information, I'm usually telling the, my assistants which type of, um, which CT size we want to have taken on them. And for those of you who are talking, who are thinking about radiation and dosage levels, uh, if you look at that 10 by 8, and if you do a rapid form, it's only 25.2 microsieverts. If you do a standard form, it's 78.3. Remember I said the average FMX is around 170 microsieverts. So we are giving them less, half or less, depending on which one we take. And look at some of these scans. You can really be able to see what's going on in the mouth, really tell some great detail of what's happening within the mouth. Look at the anatomical structures. You can see you know, the sinuses. You can see exactly where they go to. And you're able to measure within 0.1 millimeter to these. So you can be extremely accurate in what you do and how you do it. Um, so obviously, using the axial form here on the right, you can see that that really helps us see how wide the bone is because a lot of times, and I'll show you in the next x-ray, if you look at this particular slide, by looking at the sagittal view, you may see that, hey, you know, that had plenty of bone there. Well, there's a lot of length there. That should be fine for an implant. But then as you look at the left and you look at the axial view, you can see that the bone does have some issues there. And if you were just to place that implant right in the center, half of it would be sitting outside the bone. So that's why it's crucial to be able to see and understand things in a CBCT. Um, also, you can draw out all your structures. Like I said, I used to do that like all, all the time when I first started. And it was kind of fun to do. But then after a while, you learn where it is and you just kind of work around it. But for those of you that want to do it, it literally takes like a minute to draw that out and see exactly where the nerve is. And then the next step you would do is place implants in there to see what size implant you want to place, whether you want to make it longer or shorter, or if you want to place that implant deeper. You know, there's a lot of different things you can do. You measure the bone, you measure your implants. And like I said, the software has a number of different implant companies, um, implants in there. So you're able to place them and check and see that, so whether you want to do this uh, by freehand or get a surgical guide for it. You can also do things like this. It takes you about a minute to do, but you can show the patient very well how they, maybe their wisdom teeth are wrapped around the nerve. And maybe you, you could be something that you want to do or something that you might want to refer. Either way, that's fine, but it really allows you and gives you the choice of how you want to do this and whether you treat you want to treat these kind of patients or sedate them or just refer them out altogether. Um, so lots of great stuff to be able to show your patients and make them understand. We also show crowding in this and show them what's happening with their teeth. We also show them bone loss and things like that in this. So it helps with ortho acceptance as well. Um, so a lot of times I get asked which CBCT. Well, Prexion is the one that I'm talking about. Um, this was my second uh, CBCT, my first one I had some major issues with. Prexion has been awesome. One of the great things that they have is they're the only ones I know that have a 10-year warranty. It's the only one in the industry. Bumper to pumper 10-year warranty is unheard of in the uh, CBCT industry. Highest resolution in the industry, best image, uh, their focal spot, voxel size, and pixel size. As you, If you compare some of these different systems, 
Uh, they're amongst the highest in all of these. Speed of the scan is fantastic. Like I said, you wind up having a patient stand in the machine for about a minute. The scan takes another minute and it's up on all your computers. Uh, extremely easy to use software. They have people to come in and actually train you. They train your entire team for half a day on how to take them. Then they work just with you in the afternoon teaching you how to read the scans and what to do with them. Then they come back a couple of weeks later to kind of teach you some more advanced things in it. Um, ROI, I'll speak a little bit about what we do in our office. Um, like I said, when you want to start this, start on your own patients. Those are the best patients you're going to have. They already trust you. They love you. And you just tell them, hey, I do this procedure now. I can do it in my office. But as you start to grow more, I, we run ad, ads and AdWords with complementary CBCTs. I don't mind giving away a scan if I'm going to wind up having an implant and getting a patient out of it. Because to me, long term of a patient and an implant is worth way more than giving away a CT. Um, we're also looking at different medical billing options because they pay a lot higher reimbursements than uh, typical insurances do. Um, we average about 30 plus scans per month, so it's, it's a no-brainer and it pays for the, um, monthly, um, the monthly fee of the actual machine. So, you know, a couple of things I just wanted to say now that we're finishing up here. I know I ran over time a little bit, Tim, but um, sometimes good things fall apart so better things can come fall together uh, and my, my music kicks in and there will be better days and I do hope there are for you and for everybody involved but um, do keep that in mind this is a great time to learn something new and if implant dentistry is something you want to get into you know by all means do get into it because with every door that closes a new one opens and I truly do believe that um, so thank you for being a great audience. And uh, Tim, if you want to take it from there, my email is there if you have more questions or if you have questions you want to ask Tim. I know we have a few minutes left here. So Tim, go ahead and ask away if you have anything. You know what? There's, there is one question on uh, 2D versus 3D. So the Pano versus uh, Prexion machine that you have. Sure. Um, what's the acceptance rate and did it go up? Um, because going to a lot of these meetings, I hear people say, well, it could be, I think it is, it might be, versus a cone beam that you can actually... Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, I believe our acceptance rate has gone up tremendously. Now, you got to remember, we're an office that likes to show everything. We like to show pictures of everything, and we'll show those scans. And you saw that little digital video I showed a little bit. Things like that really help cell cases and makes patients understand when we show them where their bone levels are, what we can do with their case, oh. they look at you as a very sophisticated office with some oh. great technology oh. and equipment. Okay. And when we tell them how precise we are and what we do, that really helps sell a lot of these cases for us. So that part is a no brainer. Sorry, my little puppy came in here. So if you guys yeah, are, know, tell her to get out of the room. Um, um, but yeah, no, absolutely. For those of you that have any other questions too, even if after today you think of something, by all means, feel free to email me. So there was a doctor that just wrote 23 millimeters. I don't know when that popped up or what they meant. Um, and doc, if you don't mind, I'll, it was Dr. Yu, I'll take you off of, uh, off of mute. And can you elaborate a little bit more on that if you're still on? Uh, his question, as far as how much space was needed to place those two implants, the three implants? Uh-huh. Oh, he was trying to answer the question. So you came up with 23 millimeters. It was actually 24 if you did the math a little bit. Because it was three millimeters in between each implant to implant, two millimeters from implant to tooth. And then the size of the implant was 4.5, 5.5, and I believe four on the other one. I know, I put you on the spot. I made you do math too fast, but usually in the class, I let everybody kind of think about it, do the math and then come up. But for the sake of time and trying to get this information, I kind of just set it up a little bit. Okay, thanks. Sure. Thanks, Doc. Well, I do not see any more questions uh, down below, but I do want to say thank you to everyone that um, came on to the meeting. If you want to know more about Prexion, and what we can do for your office, more about the warranty, how we train, do all that good stuff. Um, reach out to us at uh, prexion.com, which is P-R-E-X-I-O-N.com. There's training videos on there. We also have a YouTube channel with previous lectures that we've been doing this month. So you'll hear Dr. Graham, 
um, Dr. Halibo, Dr. Julian. I mean, there's a series of them that, that we've been doing. So I can send you guys the link for that. I'll also send you a link for this video. Uh, my information will be on there if you guys want to take the next step and just look at a demo of our software. Obviously, we're doing them remotely right now. But uh, I will put all that in the email that you guys should be receiving in about 20 minutes. So when you registered, if you put the correct email address, I'm getting some kickback because they don't want to be spammed. But uh, if, if, there is, if it is the correct email, you'll be getting that from me in about 20 minutes. So look out for it. But that's all I got. And I appreciate everyone for coming on and look for emails for upcoming events. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, guys. Hope you all stay safe. Thank you very much.